In this video, I'm going to talk about the paper by Schaffstein and Stein on reputational herding. So the basic idea is that uh, certain kinds of experts, for example, uh, uh, hedge fund managers or uh, managers of companies, uh, they, for reputational reasons, they may often have an incentive to agree with the market or with other experts even though they privately may think otherwise uh, or disagree with the market, their actions or their words may often uh, be incentivized to agree uh, with others and with the market. And this may lead to things like, you know, uh, bubbles and uh, the sort of thing that we saw for the, in the 2008-9 in the uh, financial crisis. Uh, so before I proceed further, let me show you a short CNN clip which gives you some background on a certain kind of experts which is uh, the rating agencies like Moody's and Standard & Poor's and so on who rate uh, bonds and stocks and various uh, financial instruments for, for investors. The pain stretches from home buyers all the way to pensioners who depend upon their monthly checks. It's a result of the way that Wall Street sold mortgage investments. To do that, the Wall Street firms relied on endorsement from the credit rating agencies, Moody, Standard & Poor's and Fitch. Our story begins with a home buyer in the Bronx, New York. Giselle James got a mortgage she couldn't afford. Did you think you could afford this house? No. <laughs> no. But when James fell behind on her payments, the lender didn't have to worry. That lender, Alliance Mortgage, had already sold the mortgage to investment bank Morgan Stanley. The basic idea was, let's take a bunch of mortgages. Professor Lawrence White teaches economics at New York University's Stern School of Business. Here's these hundred mortgages. They've been packaged up into what we're now going to call a security. Securities consisting of anticipated mortgage payments that Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, and other Wall Street firms then sold to investors. That's where the credit rating agencies come in. There are three players, Standard & Poor's, Moody's, and Fitch. It's their job to rate the creditworthiness of those mortgage investments, to tell investors what's the likelihood James and other home buyers can make their monthly payments, which are supposed to flow to the investors. The rating agencies said homeowners like James were likely to pay their mortgages. Very likely. So they gave those mortgage securities their top marks, an effort critics say to generate more lucrative deals from Wall Street. The rating agencies, if you want, betrayed the people by uh, relaxing their standards, by having models that that did not recognize the objective risk conditions in the field. Giselle James was a poor credit risk. She fell into foreclosure, just like millions of other home buyers who also could not afford their mortgages. It turned out that, no, this wasn't so safe. These got, the rating firms had been way over-optimistic. Some analysts at the rating agencies knew it. Let's hope we're all wealthy and retired by the time this house of cards falters, emailed one analyst. Based on AAA ratings, Ohio's pension funds bought 263 of the mortgage securities. When the housing bubble popped, the investments plummeted. S&P, Moody's, and Fitch quickly cut their ratings from super safe to junk. But it was too late. Ohio's pension plans lost $456 million. Our investors and retirees were certainly victims of what the rating agencies did here. It's very upsetting for our investors and retirees. Uh, many of them know that the systems have been hurt. They worry about getting their checks every day. Ohio is not alone. Connecticut and California also lost millions, and they, along with Ohio, are suing the rating agencies. The agencies say they intend to defend themselves, but they're getting heat in Congress, and the financial reform bill now before the Senate would create a new office at the Securities and Exchange Commission to oversee and require more transparency of those credit rating agencies. So as you saw in that video clip, uh, one of the major reasons for the 2008 financial crisis uh, was that uh, banks had given these subprime uh, mortgage loans and they packaged them uh, and they gave it to, to 
borrowers who often didn't have the means to, to repay. They were uh, taking out these mortgages beyond their means. And then uh, the banks who lent them uh, packaged them into these mortgage-backed securities uh, and sold it to other agencies and to the financial markets. Uh, now, the ratings agencies like Moody's and S&P, uh, they gave till till the eve of the crisis, they gave these uh, uh, mortgage-backed securities triple A, their highest rating, and overnight changed it to D. So the question is, and, and, and that is what created uh, a lot of exposure to these toxic assets by a lot of institutions who then started falling like dominoes once uh, the, the assets were downgraded. So the question is, why did these uh, very reputed rating agencies uh, give such high ratings to these uh, bad assets? Uh, now, lots of things uh, can be said. Uh, for example, in the video, one perspective you heard is uh, there's some sort of moral hazard because these ratings agencies uh, are paid by the very uh, companies uh, and asset owners who um, uh, are rated by them, and that creates a conflict of interest. Uh, but in a separate clip, you will see that Warren Buffet has said that because there's a small number of these rating agencies, uh, there's uh, that it, it minimizes the race to the bottom. So if there were lots of them, then companies would shop around for the ones who are willing to give them a good rate rating, and, and that would create too much competition in the market for ratings would create a problem of its own. Uh, so the fact that there's just a, a small number of them and everybody has to go to them, uh, to some extent limits uh, the moral hazard. Uh, so, shouldn't we expect uh, a concern for reputation by the ratings agencies to uh, solve the problem? That if they, if they see an asset is unlikely to, to be good, if it's very risky, uh, the concern for their long-term reputation as reliable ratings agencies uh, should lead them to, to uh, give an honest assessment. That's what uh, we would expect. What Schostein and Stein show in this paper is that, uh, by the way, the paper was uh, written in 1990, it was published, uh, so it long preceded uh, the crisis that we are talking about from 2009. Uh, so what they show the, is, is that they bring in a different perspective, which says that it's precisely the concern about reputation which may lead these ratings agencies to uh, practice opinion herding. Right? If other agencies have rated an asset uh, highly, uh, then uh, they have an incentive to agree with them, even though privately they may have a different opinion. So let's see uh, where that comes from. Uh, and let's go through the model to understand the underlying logic. Uh, so this paper is a variation on the theme of information cascades, the Bhikchandani et al. paper that we studied earlier where there were private investors who were investing their own money. They were trying to decide whether to buy uh, an asset like an IPO, a new company. Uh, and we saw that if uh, a few people take similar decisions, for example, they start buying uh, that asset, uh, then others, even if their private information is different, uh, they will uh, mimic what the first few guys did. And that can lead to uh, uh, you know, very inefficient collective decision making. So a similar phenomenon is going to arise in this paper, but for different reasons. So in the Big Chandani paper, people were investing their own money. So they had a stake. Uh, but in spite of that, you know, that phenomenon happened. Here, the story is that people are investing other people's money. So the only reason for them to take correct decisions is to preserve their reputation. They don't want to, you know, make bad investments or they may not want to make bad investments with the client's money if it hurts them reputation wise. But as we will see, a reputation is not going to give uh, the right kind of check. In fact, it's, it's going to generate perverse motives. Uh, so, uh, so in this paper, uh, 
the agents are things like you know money managers hedge fund managers ratings agencies and so on and so forth who are who are guiding the investment decisions of others uh, uh, the money belongs to others uh, and the only sort of motive of our uh, experts in this model is their reputation for expertise they want to convince the market that they're genuine experts that they're not charlatans uh, they do have a clue they have the capability to assess the quality of various kinds of assets. Now, uh, let me tell you the critical assumption which is going to guide the, the results that we're going to talk about. Now, the critical assumption is about the nature of the information that uh, experts have. Uh, so in this model, there's going to be good experts and bad experts. Good experts are knowledgeable, they are very capable. It's not that they don't make mistakes, but they more often than not, they, they can correctly assess the quality of an asset. Whereas bad experts are much more clueless, right? They, uh, they are not very well able to, to judge what's a good asset, what's a bad, bad asset. And the critical assumption that I was mentioning is this. Signals of good experts are correlated. Uh, in a folksy way, you can say great, man, uh, great minds think like. Uh, the signals of bad experts are uncorrelated. You could say that you know, fools often differ. Uh, what do I have in mind? Let me give you an example. Suppose there's a cricket match coming up between uh, Australia and Netherlands. Now, anybody who knows about cricket will know if you if you ask a cricket expert the cricket expert is likely to say that Australia are the favorites uh, they have a high chance of winning this match and if you ask different experts if you ask uh, Sunil Gavaskar and uh, um, you know Ian Chappell uh, they'll probably agree that Australia are the favorites in this match but if you go around asking people who are who don't know anything about cricket, if you ask random Americans, you know, in this match between Australia and Netherlands, who's likely to win, um, they'll probably make a random guess. So two of them, one might say Netherlands, the other might say Australia. So you'll see a lot of divergence in the opinions of non-experts about who's the favorite in this match. But you will see a lot of convergence in the opinion of genuine cricket experts. They'll, they'll all converge on Australia. So that is uh, the kind of assumption that lies at the heart of the model, that uh, good experts have uh, noisy signals. Remember that, you know, uh, Gavaskar and Chappell may both predict an Australia win, but sometimes they are upset. So, uh, you know, five or 10% of the time, they may actually be wrong. But when they're wrong, uh, they're wrong together. Uh, so, so, Keep that in mind. Uh, this assumption about the information structure of good experts and bad experts lies at the heart of the model. So if you buy this assumption, then if you think about the reputation, um, you know, we don't know who's a genuine expert and who's trying to pose as an expert, right? Uh, who actually knows something about the subject matter and who uh, only has the ability to put on a suit at a time. Uh, so that's, uh, so the market or clients, they are trying to separate good experts and bad experts by looking at their predictions, by looking at their advice and seeing what their track record is. So in that context, reputation will be enhanced and experts or a supposed experts reputation will be enhanced by one of two things or, or two different things uh, a if they take the right decision or give the right advice right they, they say okay this asset is triple a this is a very good asset uh, we find out that the asset indeed generated good returns they advise us against another kind of asset they said this is highly risky this company is likely to go bust and indeed that happens so again we are impressed right so when reality uh, matches with their forecasts, their predictions, their decisions, uh, that enhances their reputation. But there's a second aspect which also enhances their reputation, and that is when they, their, their words or their decisions agree with that of other experts, right? 
So that is coming from this assumption about the information structure. If, if two people are making predictions about an up upcoming match and, and they both make the same prediction, to some degree we will be impressed because they think, well, they are, they are saying this thing because they are both genuine experts and they have made the same assessment. Right? So taking the right decision enhances an expert's reputation, but agreement with other experts also enhances uh, an expert's reputation, ceteris paribus. So the main point of the paper is that the second aspect can become very strong in certain contexts. Right? So B may be so strong that experts, uh, that it becomes the overwhelming or the overriding concern of experts and, and they put the maximum weight on agreeing with others rather than being right okay and and that is what drives the inefficiency that this paper captures okay so let me jump to the model um, here's the outline so it's it's again kept very simple to capture the essence of the of the phenomenon so we have two uh, let's say fund managers you could replace fund managers with let's say rating agencies Right. Fund managers make investment decisions, rating agencies give you investment advice, comes through the same thing. Uh, so two fund managers, A and B, each manager chooses whether to invest in an asset or not on behalf of their client. Now the return on that asset at the end of the day is either going to be high, so it's going to take the value XXH, think of it as the net returns, the net profits from buying that asset. Or the returns can be low, so it can take the value XL, which is some negative number, right? So in this case, the client makes losses on the investment. And uh, if, uh, the, if, if the manager chooses not to invest, the end decision, the payoff from that for the client is normalized to zero. And we'll also assume that these two outcomes, that the, that the return is high or low, they are equally likely. Uh, each has a probability of half ex ante. Now, the two managers, manager A is going to choose first, followed by manager B. Just as in the Big Chandani Herschleifer Welch paper, uh, each manager receives a private signal which can take one of two values, good or bad. So the good signal is labeled SG, the bad signal is labeled SB. Uh, these signals are noisy, right? They, they, there's a, they are sometimes wrong, even for genuine experts. Now, uh, again, as in the Big Chandani et al. paper, the second manager can observe the first manager's action. Did the first manager buy this asset or not? That is observable to the second manager. But the first manager's signal is not observed. So, so the second manager can only see what the first guy did but uh, he doesn't know on the basis of what signal or what information he did what he did. Okay, so now we come to the next slide which lays out uh, the information structure in this model that, that is being assumed. Um, there's going to be two unknowns uh, that we have to be concerned with. Firstly, each manager is either smart or dumb. So a smart manager is a genuine expert who has a lot of knowledge and a lot of capability and can often, um, with, with some probability of error, can assess the quality of an as asset uh, in a good way. So each of these managers is either smart, which has probability theta, this is the prior probability, or dumb, which has a prior probability of one minus theta. A dumb manager has inferior quality information. Now, one of the assumptions is going to be that the managers don't know the quality of their own signals or in the beginning, they don't know whether they themselves are smart or dumb, right? The market thinks that the probabilities are theta and one minus theta. The managers themselves also have the same probability distribution about their smartness or dumbness. Now, this assumption may be appropriate in some contexts, maybe uh, not so in others. Uh, if you're talking of early career experts 
or if you are talking of experts who are venturing into a new domain, a new asset class, then this uh, assumption would be more appropriate. Anyway, we'll keep it stark and simple. Uh, the, if, you, if you allow the managers also to know whether they are smart or dumb, then, then that uh, creates complications to do with signaling, that through their actions they may uh, signal their, their smartness or dumbness. So we want to keep that up. Uh, so the market as well as the managers uh, are going to learn about their own expertise as the game unfolds. Okay, so let's let's be clearer about what it means for a manager to be smart all the time, right? What it means is that the smart manager has less noisy information, uh, and the, the smart manager has less noisy information. The dumb manager has more noisy information. That's what it boils down to. So if a manager is smart, the manager gets the good and bad signals according to this conditional probability matrix, where P is the probability that the signal will be correct, and 1 minus P is the probability that the signal will be wrong or misleading. And P is a, is a number strictly between half and one, right? So precisely because P is strictly greater than half, the manager's signal contains some information. It's not infallible, it's not always correct, but it's correct more often than not. So that's the sense in which the manager has some expertise. Uh, a dumb manager's signal, we are going to assume, is pure noise, right? So each signal is equally likely as the other one in each state of the world. So all the boxes have numbers, half and half. So that means that the, if, if the manager happens to be dumb, then the signal that he receives contains no information, right? It, it will, uh, if, if he knew that this is a dumb manager, we will ignore the signal. The problem is, of course, neither the manager nor the market in the beginning knows whether the manager is smart or dumb. So, so there's a dilemma about how much weight to, to put on the signal. And last line, I have already uh, talked about it uh, extensively in the last, uh, you know, the, on, on this last point, uh, but it's very important, so you have to keep it in mind. Smart, smart, if both managers are smart, their signals will be perfectly correlated, right? They'll, if one of them gets a good signal, the other also gets the good signal, if both happen to be smart. Uh, it could, it could turn out that that signal uh, is wrong at the end of the day. That's a possibility that has the probability 1 minus p. But they do not get different signals. They always get the same signal. Whereas if both the managers are dumb, then their signals are going to be independent. So one of them could end up getting a good signal. The other could end up getting a bad signal. Um, the signals are not correlated with each other. Okay. So, reputation. What is it that these managers care about? They're not investing their own money. They're investing other people's money. So, they have career concerns, as I, as I mentioned in the introductory uh, video, that uh, they, want to, they want the market to think that they're smart and genuine experts rather than dumb charlatans. Okay. All right. So the first thing to, to absorb, to, to note, is that uh, once a manager learns his own signal, uh, the signal per se tells him nothing further about whether he's smart or dumb. And that's because of the symmetry. Both the states of the world are equally likely, and both these conditional probability matrix are, matrices are symmetric, right? So if you get uh, a good signal, your belief about whether you're smart or dumb remains unchanged. It remains at the prior, which is theta and one minus theta. And the same happens if uh, you get a bad signal. This is a typo, this should be S. Sorry, this is SG. So, um, well, let me, let me change that. Um, If the manager is smart, uh, 
then he has overall at the beginning he has a probability half of getting a good signal right because both states are equally likely similarly if the manager is dumb he has a probability half uh, of, of getting a good signal so both good and manager and, and, and bad experts uh, see a good signal half the time and see a bad signal half the time so that's why when they see their signal that does not lead to any updation of their self-belief about whether they're smart or dumb. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, now, although a single signal does not convey any, ex uh, any new information about expertise, two signals together can convey uh, some information about uh, expertise, whether an expert is smart or dumb. So for example, if, if it becomes known that the two managers got the same signal, either both good or both bad, uh, then that should enhance our belief that they are genuine experts because, you know, uh, genuine expert signals are correlated. Uh, it's possible that they're both dumb, but they just got the same signal by accident, but good uh, or smart uh, experts uh, always get the same signal whereas uh, dumb experts sometimes get the same signal. So, so that updates beliefs. <clears throat> now, in our game, the market will observe each manager's action, but not their signals. So the signals are always going to be private information. So that's why uh, there's going to be some gaming and some you know, clever manipulation which will arise uh, with respect to, to the signals. Uh, but the markets only see the actions, whether they invested or did not invest. Uh, also in this model, we'll assume that the, mar that the market will eventually find out the state of the world. Right? Um, of course, it will be too late. Uh, the decision will have already been taken. But each manager chooses to invest or not to invest in that asset. And after some passage of time, uh, the market finds out whether the asset was good or bad, whether the return was X8 or X7. So that's going to be part of the uh, uh, input into calculating reputation. Um, now, so each manager gets his signal um, and then makes a decision whether to invest or not. And then the state of the world is revealed whether the asset was good or not. And then the market revises their belief about each manager, whether they're smart or dumb. So initially they had a belief theta that the manager is smart, and now they revise it to some theta hat. And what will go into the calculation of theta hat is what are the actions that the managers did and what was the eventual state of the world as it was revealed, whether the asset was good or bad. Um, and the experts in this model are purely reputation driven, so they have their eyes fixed firmly on this theta hat. This is what they want to be as high as possible. Okay, so before we uh, study the main model, as usual in these information models, uh, let's uh, think about uh, three benchmark cases, right? So these are different cases, uh, but we need to study them to, to understand what happens in the main game. So benchmark 1A, there's a single investor and one signal, right? So let's remove manager B from the picture. Uh, let's say there's a, a single investor. Let's even make the single investor an owner investor. So, so this is somebody who receives the signal but is investing his own money. So this benchmark tells us what is the efficient uh, sort of decision, right? uh, what, what should ideally be done in terms of maximizing returns to, to the decision. So, um, so this investor does not care about reputation at all, only cares about returns. Now, um, the investor, the single investor can either get a good signal or a bad signal. So in each case, you have to calculate the posterior probability that the return is high given the signal. Okay, and these are the two expressions. I'll, I'll uh, quickly go through them. 
and uh, so if these expected values are positive then the optimal decision is to invest otherwise it's to not invest okay so suppose the signal is good which this investor has received well as i said before in the previous slide that the signal does not change the belief about whether you're smart or dumb okay so that remains at theta and one minus theta so in case you're smart probability theta uh, and you receive this good signal then your updated belief on the returns being high will go up from half to p we have done this this uh, patient updating many many times so you should be familiar uh, with it by now so with probability theta, I, I am this investor, I've received this good signal. Uh, with probability theta, I'm smart. And then if that is the case, then with probability P, the returns are high. Now with probability one minus theta, I'm actually dumb, right? In which case my signal is pure noise and the probability that the state is, you know, the returns are high is just half the, the time. So this is the overall probability. Now, instead, if I received a bad signal, then again, with probability theta, I'm still smart. But in that case, uh, this signal is a wrong signal, right? Um, or, or rather, if, if, the, if the returns are high, then this signal I've just seen, the bad signal, must be a wrong signal. What's the probability of that? That's one minus p. And again, as before, with probability one minus theta, I am actually dumb in which case the belief that the returns are high should remain stuck at the brown half. Okay, so these are two magnitudes. So to make the problem interesting, we are going to assume that the first of these is negative and the second is, uh, sorry, the second is negative and the first expression is positive. What that does is that guarantees that uh, if our investor was investing his own money and sitting in an island and not watching anybody else, then his decision is going to hinge on his signal, right? Good signal, he invests, bad signal, he stays away from buying this asset. So we'll make that assumption that the parameters are such that this is true. Uh, okay, let's move on to another benchmark. Now let's now bring in uh, a second signal. Suppose the single investor gets a second signal. So he's sitting on two different signals. Okay. What would be his optimal decision rule? So still a single investor, still he's investing his own money based on these two signals. Uh, the reason for looking at this is to understand what role the second signal plays in decision making or ought to play in decision making. Okay. So the investor knows uh, two signals. Now there are four cases. Both signals could be good, both signals could be bad, and one could be good, one could be bad. Right. Now, in those situations where the two signals are the same, the decision is fairly simple. Even a single good signal leads you to invest. So two good signals will definitely lead you to invest. A single bad signal leads you not to invest, to stay away from this asset. So two bad signals will lead to the same consequence. So those cases are simple. What if the signals are of opposite value? One is a good signal, the other is a bad signal. So in that case, as again, given the sort of overall symmetry, uh, the two signals cancel each other out. So we're back to square one. So the posterior belief that the returns are high is equal to half uh, if the two signals are opposite. Right? We, are, we are back to the priors. So now, should this investor invest or not in this situation? Well, that depends on whether the average of XH and XL is positive or negative, right? Uh, if it's strictly positive, then invest. If it's strictly negative, then don't invest. So the bottom line of this slide is that there will always be situations where the second signal will influence the decision. So for example, um, suppose, um, uh, suppose we have um, XH plus XL is, is strictly less than zero, let's say, right? Just randomly picking one of the two cases. So then suppose the first signal was good, okay? Uh, so if that was the only information available, 
it would have been optimal to invest. Uh, but if a second signal turns out to be bad, then the optimal decision flips to non-investment, right? So when two signals are available, there will always be some combination of the signals which will lead to the second signal being decision relevant. It would overturn the decision that you would have taken based on the first signal alone. So this is something useful to keep in mind. What we will see when we go to the main game and study the behavior of the second manager, the second manager is just going to mimic the first manager. So he's going to ignore the information in the second signal. And what this slide is saying is that that's not efficient. There is, there is some loss of uh, decision-making efficiency uh, when, the, when the manager, for reputational reason, uh, behaves that way. Okay, let's come to a third benchmark. Um, and now, instead of considering investors who are investing their own money, let's uh, start inching back towards our main case, which we're interested in studying which is it's a manager or a hedge fund manager who's investing other people's money and is worrying about reputation. So in, our, in this last benchmark, we have a single manager, right? Uh, there's not two managers, but only one. Um, and he cares about reputation, not about the returns from the investment per se. So, uh, so again, the bottom line of this slide is that a single manager in isolation, uh, when he worries about reputation, he's still going to make efficient investment decisions. Nothing is going to uh, go wrong, right? Uh, reputation is going to drive him to take the right action in his client's interest. So the client's interest won't be compromised in, in this case. So why is that? Uh, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, um, suppose the market expects him to act the right way. So when he sees the good signal, uh, he's supposed to invest. Uh, when he sees the bad signal, he's supposed to not invest. The question is, will he want to stick to that or fulfill that expectation? <clears throat> now, in this situation of a single manager, uh, what happens is the manager's reputation is solely dependent on whether at the end of the day his decision was correct or wrong. Okay, uh, When his decision is correct, so these are the two cases, when he uh, invests, which means he, he's telling the market that I got a, got a good signal, that's cheap, and when the returns actually turn out to be high, then his reputation theta hat uh, goes above theta, his initial uh, reputation. Similarly, when he uh, when he stays away from the asset and the asset quality is revealed to be bad at the end of the day, again his reputation improves. But whenever he's wrong, and he can have that can happen in two ways: he invests in a bad asset, or he um, doesn't invest in a good asset. In both of those cases, his reputation falls. Right. So what he's trying to do is he's trying to get into one of these two cases rather than these two cases. Right? That, that's what his entire effort is geared towards. Now, when he gets a good signal, remember that both states are equally likely to begin with before, before any signal comes through. So when he gets a good signal, you can do the base rule updating, etc. No wonder that his belief that the returns are high goes above half. And when he gets a, a bad signal, the, uh, the his, his probability calculation that the state is that this is a good asset drops below half okay so all he cares about is being right so whenever he thinks one state is more likely than the other he will take the corresponding action so when he got a good signal he thinks that the asset is good with more than 50 percent chance and so if he invests there'll be more than 50 percent chance that the market will think he's smart and so he invests in that case. Okay, so his uh, reputational incentives get totally aligned with the client's interests, right? So maximizing reputation for the manager and maximizing returns for the client show no divergence in this case when there's a single manager. Okay, so all these, uh, all these uh, 
benchmark cases or idealized cases where things don't go wrong, right? So now let's come to our main game where uh, you have these two managers A and B uh, and they receive their signals and they act in sequence. Manager B gets to see what manager A did before making his decision. Well, so we have to solve the game by backward induction. We have to first, um, you know, we have to figure out what each of them do. Uh, so one thing to note is that manager A will act nicely, right? He will strictly go by his signal. When he gets a good signal, he will invest. When he gets a bad signal, he will stay away from buying the asset. Uh, that's claim one. That's this theory. Um, why is that? Well, the reason is very simple. As we will see in the next two slides, manager B, the second manager, is the one who misbehaves, who, who, who acts in funny ways, right? In particular, we will show uh, that manager B always mimics manager A, right? And in equilibrium, the market knows this. The market knows that uh, the second manager has a strong incentive to opinion heard with the first manager. So if that is the case, then what the first manager does is the only source of information available to the market, the only meaningful source of information based on which the market assesses his ability, right? So A's reputation is only affected by his own actions because B just mimics him. So B's uh, actions are going to be, uh, going to have no information content. Now, we have already seen in benchmark uh, B, uh, sorry, benchmark two, that a single manager acting in isolation goes by the signal. So in this in this game, the first manager uh, is going to make his decision faithfully based on his signal, and um, and that's going to be it. Um, so a single manager will always, so to speak, reveal his signal truthfully through his decision. Um, now, there's a, th this last point is relatively minor. You could imagine, technically, you could create an equilibrium where the manager reveals his signal to the market by doing the opposite of uh, what is the appropriate action. So when he sees a good signal, he chooses not to invest. When he sees a bad signal, he chooses to invest. If that is understood the market, the market will still be impressed, but the client will, will suffer, you know, uh, bad decisions. So we rule that out. Uh, you know, if the if the manager has like you know maybe a one percent or two percent commission of the profits made by the client, then this sort of thing will not arise. Okay, here are the two interesting results in this and the next uh, couple of slides. First of all, there is no equilibrium in which manager B always reveals his signal. So manager B is going to game it, right? Manager B is going to um, uh, not always uh, follow a course of action which uh, reflects his signal truthfully. Um, why is that? So let's go through that logic and, and uh, that is key to understanding the paper. Uh, suppose there's a revealing equilibrium, okay? So suppose manager B also follows his signal. He gets a good signal, he chooses investment for his client. If he gets a bad signal, he doesn't. Um, or at least some of the time, in some cases, he does that. So, uh, now, uh, let's look at the following situation. Suppose manager A did not invest, right? Since manager A acts honestly, if he did not invest, that means he has revealed to the market and to the next manager uh, that his signal was bad, that he got a bad signal, that's why he did not invest. So manager B knows that. And now suppose manager B's own signal is good. So his own signal has conflicted with the uh, previous guy's signal as revealed through his uh, choice. Uh, so what is the second manager going to do in this situation? That is the question we have to, we have to evaluate, right? 
and I'm going to argue that in this sort of situation where his own signal has conflicted with the previous guys, he will always uh, suppress that information and always mimic what the previous guy did. Uh, so if the market expects him to go by his signal, he will lie. He will, in this situation, he, instead of revealing that his signal is good, he will, re he will lie to the market that his signal is bad by mimicking what the first manager did, namely not invest. Ah, so he will misreport his signal if the market's expectation that is that he's honest. Uh, so let's see why. Um, again, we'll focus on this situation, right? First manager got a bad signal. Everybody can infer that from what he did. The second manager secretly, privately got a good signal. So now what is the second manager going to do? Well, in his own head, when he's calculating things, first of all, he's, he's trying to evaluate the probability of the two states, that there's a good asset versus there's a bad asset. Well, the two signals being conflicting, they cancel each other out, right? So the high returns and the low returns again become equally likely. They're back to the priors. So that's point number one. Now, if the second manager is to truthfully reveal his signal by investing, if, if that's what we want him to do, then this incentive constraint has to be satisfied, right? What are on two sides of this inequality? On the left side, let me first say it in words and then we'll work through the detail here. Uh, on the left side is his expected reputation. Uh, if he reports truthfully, if he tells the market as it were, that he has received a good signal in conflict with the previous manager's signal. And on the right hand side of the inequality is his expected reputation if he lies, if he misreports, if he falsely tells the market that he also got a bad signal just as the previous guy. So these are the two expected reputations and if you want him to be honest then you want the first term to be bigger, at least as big as the second term. So the question is, can that be the case? Can this incentive constraint ever be satisfied? And the answer is no, it cannot be satisfied, right? So he will always get a greater expected reputation from lying in this situation rather than telling the truth. So why is that? Okay, before getting into that, let's, sorry, uh, look at each of these components. So let's focus on this, this term, right? So if he truthfully reports that his signal is good by investing, then he will land up in one of two situations. This is the first of those situations. So let's understand this. SB is the signal of the first manager as has been revealed to the market by his non-investment. Our manager, the second guy, has just truthfully told the market that he's got a good signal, the opposite of the first guys. And then at the end of the day, the stock or the asset may turn out to be a good one. The returns may turn out to be high. So that's one possible situation. The second situation has the same first two components. The first manager's signal is bad. The second manager has told the market that he has got a good signal. And then the asset turns out to be actually bad. Right. Now, if you look at the first of these two situations here, the manager or second manager, uh, reality agrees with his signal, right? So he turns out to be correct at the end of the day. He tells the market, I got a good signal, the asset turns out to be good, right? So reality agrees with him. But the other expert disagreed with him. So, so, uh, so that's what happens here. Uh, whereas over here, what happens is that uh, the, he tells the market that he got a good signal, the asset turns out to be a dud, and the other expert also had a different assessment. So here, the other expert as well as reality disagrees with him, right? So in each of these vectors, uh, there are two potential agreements or disagreements, one with the other expert, the other is with reality as it's revealed at the end of the day. Now obviously in this context um, uh, each, any agreement is a good thing. It will set a risk other things. 
equal, it will enhance reputation, right? Other things equal, if you are in agreement with the uh, other, other uh, expert, uh, then that's good news for your reputation. Because remember that, uh, um, that uh, smart people, smart experts get correlated signals, right? They don't get different signals. Um, um, and also, if reality agrees with you, that's again a vote of confidence. That, that's a plus thing, right? Uh, so reputation will depend on these two things. Now, the argument why this inequality, this incentive constraint will never be satisfied uh, can be understood now uh, with this sort of intuitive sketch. By the way, if you look at the paper, uh, all of these posterior probabilities or reputation calculations can be done explicitly. Right? So in the paper they have these expressions using Bayes' rule and so on. So we could take the hard algebraic route and you know derive those expressions and then check this inequality. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to give you uh, an intuitive sketch of why uh, this inequality will always be violated and so the second expert will never truthfully reveal his signal when it's conflict when it's in conflict with the first guy's signal. Uh, okay, so there are two expressions, two reputation expressions on both sides. So let me compare pairs of these. Uh, so the first comparison is this um, SBSGXH uh, and SBSBXL. Okay, so let's compare this with this. So what's happening here? This is on the left-hand side, the first term on the left-hand side. Here, um, our second expert has one agreement and one disagreement. Reality agrees with him. The other expert uh, disagrees with him, right? Now, if you compare it to the term here, here he has two agreements. Both reality and the other expert uh, agrees with him. So obviously his reputation in this situation will be strictly higher than his reputation in this situation. Okay, so that means that uh, this term is always strictly bigger than this term. Now, let's compare the other two terms from the left and the right hand side. So over here, you have SPSBXH. So there's one agreement with our expert. He reveals a bad signal, the other expert also got a bad signal. Uh, so the other expert has agreed with him, but reality has disagreed with him. The asset turned out to be good. So one agreement over here. Now, if you compare it to this term on the left hand side, here the number of agreements is actually zero. Okay, Both the other expert and reality, unfortunately, uh, disagreed with our expert. So once again, in this situation of one agreement, uh, his reputation is going to be bigger than in this situation of zero agreements. So, you have two agreements here and one agreement here, and you have one agreement here and zero agreements here. So, the right hand side is always going to be strictly higher than the left hand side, okay? Uh, because we, can, we have just shown it term by term. So the main thing is that, you know, when their signals are in conflict, uh, when our second manager asks himself which state is more likely, is this a good asset or a bad asset, that has gone back to 50-50 because the two conflicting signals have cancelled each other out. Uh, so both states of the world are equally likely. Uh, so whichever uh, signal he reveals to the market, uh, it has a 50% chance of agreeing with reality. So that washes out, right? Whether he tells the market that he got a good signal or a bad signal, each has an equal probability of agreeing with the market. But he can at least guarantee that uh, his, uh, his claimed signal agrees with the other guy's signal, 
right? So, so if the first guy didn't invest, uh, he can tell the market, oh, I also got a bad signal. So then he at least guarantees that uh, the other ex he's in agreement with the other expert, right? And that becomes therefore the sort of uh, dominant uh, reason for him. And, and the overall idea is that um, it is better to be, there's strength in numbers, right? It's better to be wrong with others than to be wrong alone. Um, being wrong alone uh, gives you a very high penalty, right? So in a cricket match, all the experts predicted Australia, and then somehow, um, uh, you know, Netherlands won, and, uh, and the market says, oh, at least, you know, they all agreed that they're true experts. I mean, this was a, an exception. This was an upset. Uh, the market won't think too badly of these uh, predictions coming from these experts. Uh, but but then everybody made one prediction and you are the only one to go against the flow and you turn out to be wrong at the end of the day, that, that, that's just disastrous. Uh, you'll be singled out as a fool. Now, uh, okay, so what we have seen is that um, you can't expect the second manager to to be always honest. Now this next theorem says that um, you can always find an equilibrium where the, not only does the second manager sometimes lie, he kind of goes to the extreme and always does exactly what the first guy did. He never uh, makes an independent departure, no matter what his signal is. He, he, he just blindly mimics 100% of the time. You can always construct an equilibrium of that sort. You can never construct an equilibrium where he solely follows his signal, and you can always construct an equilibrium where he just mimics the first guy's decision. Okay, so why is that? Let's uh, quickly uh, look at the underlying reasoning, and again, I'll give you the sort of uh, sketchy outline that I gave you for the previous proposition. Um, now to do this, we have to specify off the equilibrium path beliefs, right? So so in equilibrium is the second guy is supposed to always echo what the first guy did, right? Then what if he deviates from that behavior and what if, you know, the first, suppose the first guy uh, chose to invest and the second guy chooses not to invest. Now he's not supposed to do that in equilibrium, but he might. And uh, we have to then think about what will be the market's perception if this off the equilibrium path behavior arises. Right? So every equilibrium hangs on uh, what is specified about this sort of off the equilibrium path move. Uh, now, perfect Bayesian equilibrium does not impose anything stringent on off the equilibrium path beliefs. But here, if you think about it intuitively, you know, this seems to be a reasonable of the equilibrium path beliefs and we'll, we'll specify this to be the case. If B disagrees with A, then we will assume that uh, B's disagreement is based on his signal. So if, if B disagrees and chooses investment, then of the equilibrium path belief is that his signal must have been good, right? He, why did he why did he become such a contrarian well it must be his signal is pushing him in that direction and if he disagrees with the first guy and chooses non-investment then the market thinks that his signal must have been a bad signal right so this this seems commonsensical as choice of, of the equilibrium of beliefs okay so let's see if this can be equilibrium behavior that uh, he always mimics our second manager always mimics the first manager, and in case it deviates from that, then the market's perception will be driven by this, this first bullet point. Okay, so here is our incentive constraint. If he sticks to his equilibrium behavior, then his reputation neither goes up nor goes down, right? And the reason for that is very simple. If, he is all, if we know that he always mimics the first uh, manager, always, always repeats what the first guy did, then his decision uh, reveals no information about what his signal might be and so we have no basis for uh, thinking uh, better or worse of him right 
So if he sticks to his equilibrium behavior, his reputation remains stuck at theta. It doesn't go up, it doesn't go down. Now what if he deviates from his equilibrium behavior? So suppose, again, without loss of generality, we'll still stick to the case where, let's say, the first guy chose non-investment, so the market thinks that the first guy got a bad signal. That's the SP over here. And um, so, what if the second guy um, gets a good signal and in this equilibrium, he's supposed to mimic the first guy, so he's supposed to misreport to the market that he also got a bad signal, but suppose he suddenly chooses to be honest, right? Suddenly he has an epiphany and he decides, oh, I'll, I'll play honest. So he tells the market that he got a good signal. Well, two things might happen. One is that the state might end up to be, you know, the asset might tend, end up to be a good asset or it might tend, end up being a bad asset. Right? So those are the two cases and each of them are equally likely because remember that the two signals being opposite to each other, they cancel out and uh, the two states become equally likely again. Okay, now, now this inequality can be uh, rewritten in this form. And there's a typo here. Uh, this this uh, should be reversed, as as you can easily check. So this should be greater than or equal to. Now, uh, so the final uh, argument is that uh, this inequality always has to be true. So why is that? Uh, if you look at the right hand side. Um, in this situation, there's one agreement and one disagreement. Reality agrees with our uh, second manager, but the other expert uh, disagrees with him. Uh, so there will be a certain change in his reputation for that reason. But over here, the gap between theta and theta hat is going to be larger. Why is that? Because here, the situation is really dire. All right? Our expert has told the market that he got a good signal that disagrees with the other expert signal uh, and that also happens to disagree with reality so there's uh, not a single agreement over here both are disagreements and as a result he will suffer uh, a pretty big hit to his uh, to his reputation and over here he will only uh, experience a, maybe a slight gain in his reputation so so for that reason this inequality with with this typo corrected will uh, always be true. So again, um, reputation loss from being wrong alone is greater than the reputation gain from being right alone. Right, that's the key intuition over here. Okay, so let's let's uh, sum it up. Um, you know, uh, going back to our example which we started with the ratings agencies like Moody's and S&P's and so on. Uh, to the extent uh, their uh, incredibly bad performance in rating these uh, uh, mortgage-backed securities, they gave them triple A ratings uh, even up to the eve of the collapse. Um, to the extent it's because, you know, they are uh, rating their own clients uh, maybe that sort of thing can be fixed. Maybe you can change the payment system. Maybe they can be paid by um, uh, not by these companies who are being rated, but by you know investors in the market. So you can you can have you can think about ways of changing that around. Uh, you can think of you know allowing more competition in that market or less competition and, and uh, other things. Uh, but this sort of reputational concern is. Um, intrinsic right their ability to come across uh, or their desire to come across as uh, uh, knowledgeable about the assets that they are rating uh, leads to the kind of behavior that we have just seen now uh, there has to be a lot of informational specialization um, you know we as investors uh, there are thousands of different kinds of assets and it's impossible for us to uh, do our own research all the time uh, to decide where to put our money uh, and and so uh, there has to be a role for 
knowledge experts, for uh, specializers in information. But if they suffer from this sort of um, uh, this sort of uh, gaming tendency, this sort of you know reputation manipulation, then that can lead to the kind of disasters that we have seen, um, that we saw in 2008. So what is the way out of it? I, you know, there's no definite um, lesson here except to make us aware of the problem. Uh, maybe, maybe there should be more simplification in financial markets. Maybe we shouldn't have such complex derivatives where either we as investors cannot find out about them uh, properly and neither can we uh, trust uh, professional, uh, professional, um, uh, market players, professional uh, rating agencies, because they'll suffer from this sort of disincentive, this sort of uh, manipulative motive. Uh, so, so perhaps one uh, lesson uh, is is to simplify the structure of our financial markets, so that such complex assets don't have to be uh, traded all over the place. Uh, or you can think of other solutions if you can think of better solutions. But I think this paper holds some key insight into why things can go wrong in a way which is uh, deeply embedded in the, in the nature of these markets uh, and the nature of uh, information that we are looking for. Uh, so, so, so that's a lesson that we have to bear in mind.